Hey, hello! If you were with me last week, or if you just looked at the thumbnail of this video, let's be real, you know that today we are going to be diving in and exploring at least a little bit of Julie Garwood's historicals. And if you were part of the romance reading community, or again were here last week, you probably know that Julie Garwood passed away in June. And Julie Garwood looms pretty large for me as an author, and as was discussed in the Faded Mates podcast episodes about Julie Garwood that I listened to, both their first kind of more sprawling exploration of Julie Garwood, and then their more recent episode about the book The Bride, which is one of the books we will be talking about today, I have this idea in my head of Julie Garwood being this huge historical romance name in a way that almost looms larger than her actual historical romance presence and this being outside of me being of age when she was really at her height in historical romance as well. So that's a different kind of anecdotal observation. But before I kind of circle back to my personal history with Julie Garwood, before we even dive into the texts of Julie Garwood that I reread for today, I want to kind of set this in the current moment as well because I went to the bookstore today when I honestly should have been recording this video, but I noticed that this particular bookstore, which is one of my favorites in the city, I have many to be fair, has a huge romance presence now. It has an entire wall almost of romance titles. And when I was looking at this wall, now granted there was a romance section and then a gay romance section as well, but between those two sections I only saw one small selection of mass market romances and those were backlist Cat Sebastian titles, which as a romance reader are still relatively new. And so there's this kind of give and take as a long-standing romance reader that I've talked about on this channel a lot in the excitement of seeing romance really embraced more generally and pick up steam, especially on places like TikTok. Not that it's ever been without steam, but then also kind of clocking this shift in the genre, both from consumers and newer consumers of the genre, but also the way that publishers are kind of using that new attention and these new readers to kind of move things in the direction that they want to in some ways. And what I mean by that is this lack of mass market presence. And because of that, I also, as someone who came up reading historicals, historical romances were my first entry into the genre, seeing them not be as popular. We do have historical romances in trade paperback, and we obviously have the immense popularity of Bridgerton, but there's almost this absence of these big names of historical romance in the bookstore oftentimes. We're talking Lisa Kleypas, we're talking Julia Quinn, and we're of course talking like our Julie Garwoods, our Joanna Lindsay's, our Judith McNaughts, these authors that we often see grouped together and the real giants of the genre, Nora Roberts notwithstanding. But of those three J names, as they are often referenced, especially on places like Faded Mates, Julie Garwood was my J name. And as much as I talk about Julia Quinn, who would probably be one of my other cornerstone J names in my own personal kind of romance reading hierarchies and who formed me as a reader, as Faded Mates would talk about installing my buttons as a reader, Julie Garwood was really the author that did that. As much as I talk about my history as a teenager with Bridgerton and how it was one of the first romance series that I really became enveloped in in some ways. Despite that, Julia Quinn, while one of my introductions into the genre, was not what welcomed me to the genre initially because that was Julie Garwood. Now I don't have perfect records of this time because as I mentioned last week a lot of my record keeping that I took from physical logs into Goodreads in 2007-ish I didn't always perfectly import the dates because I don't know why and I think I've kind of gone back occasionally when I go home to my childhood bedroom to kind of try and cross-reference some of this but even that has been imperfect. But despite that I know that I read Julie Garwood titles slightly before I read Julia Quinn titles. I know that like Scottish romances were my introduction to historical romance despite the fact that I really moved away from them as an adult reader because I've kind of gotten into some ruts in my reading and also because Julie Garwood really was my introduction. Her voice looms so large in my memory, in my mind, my memory specifically before the last week, that it's hard to kind of go back into that space sometimes. Now that's not fair either. It's just something I've naturally 
actually fallen away from a little bit, but am going to be circling back to, especially because after the passing of Julie Garwood, we have talked and have plans to read The Secret for my book club. So the two books that I revisited for today were The Bride and The Secret. I had downloaded Shadow Music on audio and did not get it read in time, but I so clearly remember that book coming out because that came out in 2007 and it was a big deal that we were getting a new Julie Garwood historical because even at that time she really had started to move away from historicals and yet the historicals, her historicals are what I associate her with and they're my kind of foundation as a reader. I went from Julie Garwood. It's kind of easy to see because I went from Julie Garwood. I stayed in that Highland space for a while but particularly with time travel within that Highland space with authors like Karen Marie Monning and Lynn Kurland. But then I also started to offshoot into things like Julia Quinn. And rereading Julie Garwood really kind of, I recognize as a reader why I responded to Quinn because I also responded to Garwood. Because I was listening to Faded Mates and they were talking about the humor of these books. And before I reread these books that I reread this last week, I didn't really have a firm understanding of what they were talking about there, even as Julie Garwood's introduction to the ebook of The Bride has a quote where she says, when I was first beginning to write historical romance, I was told by experts to downplay the humor because readers had certain expectations and wouldn't respond to it. And yet the humor is what I respond to so much, clearly, between Julie Garwood and then going in to Julia Quinn, which has this kind of like quippy, dialogue heavy, almost feels a lot more like importance of being earnest, which I know I've said before, and I also just have a tendency to kind of correlate humor of that time, high society, with kind of earnest humor, but it does seem to fit. And Garwood has a particular quippiness to her dialogue as well. She has these really spunky heroines. There's a little bit of physical humor to everything, especially in The Bride. Toward the end of the book, there's that scene, and we'll talk more in depth about these books, don't worry, where Jamie comes in and is basically like, Alec, I have a situation that I need some help with. And he's like, you've got it, take care of it. And then she like goes over to the wall and grabs a club and is seen like taking the club out side. And so there is this physical humor to things, even amidst that kind of banter and quippiness. And the banter and quippiness is there even amidst these like different social constructs. And so it's a different kind of banter, but it's a banter nonetheless. And so while these historical romances that came out between like the late 80s to I believe the early 2000s, if we especially count Shadow Music, which came out in 2007, do have their flaws. Remember, we We've talked about romance, especially as a genre, moving much quicker. And these are books that are like 30, 40 years old at this point. And so our kind of societal understanding of a lot of things is much different, not only in the kind of gender dynamics of things, which I do think are still pretty progressive at the time, because at this time, like the alpha heroes were very popular. They're still very popular in a lot of different subgenres. And Scottish romance is one of them. Highland romance is one of them. That's kind of where you're going for a kind of historical faded mates almost. And so there are these things that can be explored and unpacked, obviously. And then there are other things that don't carry as well, even with that understanding, particularly one of the twists in The Bride, I personally had a lot of issues with, even if the rest of the book was very nostalgic in a lot of ways. There are those things that you kind of have to divorce yourself from a little bit, not completely ignore them, I should say, but be willing and able to recognize what's going on, but also critique the thing in the same way that I do with Bridgerton. So there is a little bit of that tension, but I was honestly surprised with how well these books held up. I had been hesitant for a long time to even recommend them to my book club because I was afraid of how they'd read today. The Karen Marie Monning that we read months ago did not hold up as well, I personally don't think, as even these books. Now granted, I won't be talking about The Secret with my book club until next month, so I can't say that definitively 
for the group, I can't say that's the group consensus, but that is my personal consensus about it. So let's briefly set up these books. We've got The Bride with Alec and Jamie, which I think is kind of like the platonic ideal of a Julie Garwood. Now granted, I have not read all of Julie Garwood's historicals. I was, as I mentioned last week, limited to what I had access to from the library. So there are a lot, even though I have talked about the fact that there are less historicals that even I really thought there were that I haven't read because they weren't accessible to me. That could be for many reasons. It could be the library just didn't buy them. It could be they were out before I was of an age to read them based on when they were being published. And if they kind of just fell out of circulation, they could have been weeded out of circulation because people weren't reading them, they could have fallen apart, and it was deemed that they couldn't be repaired, or that it wasn't worth it to buy another copy based on circulation. There are so many factors, especially considering I was in a really small library district at the time, but I was in a library district with a really robust romance readership, and as I mentioned before, was a really positive space regarding romance. My librarians actively recommended romance to me, they talked about romance with me. It was a really great place to come up as a reader, made even better by the fact that by this point I was working at the library and so really had access to all the books I wanted, being able to browse through the mass market spinners and just the joy of that. And I think part of that is why I am so sad by the death of the mass market, which I think is a much bigger conversation. And I mentioned it in my video about publishing forcing readership to adapt and had one of my friends more closely aligned in the industry kind of confirm that observation that it really is kind of dying. And that's either the cause or the effect of me personally switching a lot of my romance reading over to e-reading, but also how different the e-reading experience is from the physical book in some ways, in a way that I was observing a lot more while rereading these books because I read them for the first time in mass market. And while my thumbs aren't, you know, ink stained at this point, and I'm grateful for that, there is something to be said about the pacing of these books and kind of feeling how far you are in the book, where you are in the book, book by where you are physically in the book. And even when there is a kind of meter at the bottom of the e-reader telling you where you are, it's a much different thing than being able to kind of like subconsciously flip to the end of the chapter and kind of feel where you are physically in the book. And I don't know how to articulate that. And if I am absolutely out of my mind here, let me know. But also if any of that resonates with you, let me know as well. So going back to The Bride, we open with our heroine Jamie, or more accurately, we open with her crying sisters and her father, more accurately her stepfather, upset because the kings have ordered them to be married. So they're basically being married off to the Scottish lairds. They are English. There is a lot of bad blood there. These historicals also often set up that rivalry or contentiousness between our romantic leads, whether it be English versus Scottish, whether it be rival clans, that's usually at the heart of something. And so this book sets off with this expectation that one of Jamie's sisters, two of Jamie's sisters potentially, are going to be married off to these Scottish lairds. But her father has kept her out of consideration because he claims to love her too much, though it becomes clear that she's just too useful to him. She does most of the housekeeping and the running of the household for him. And she additionally frequently sacrifices herself for her sisters, even though there is that love there. There's also a misunderstanding of that responsibility because she, as the youngest, is often acting as traditionally the oldest would behave. And I say that as an oldest. But the beginning of this book gave me a little bit of like King Lear vibes in some ways, or that's the kind of jumping off point. So both of these two lairds, Alec of course being the most important, arrive and they find out that basically this baron is keeping one of his daughters from them, and that she is the most valuable daughter because the stable hand, who is also Scottish, basically ratted him out because he loves Jamie and thinks that this marriage would be good for her. And so they get married. And most of this book, well not most of it, a large part of this book is them traveling back from this wedding. But it also made me kind of look because the wedding is so early here. I mean the name of the book is The Bride. These aren't exactly subtle titles, at least the two I reread. And so you have a kind of marriage of convenience set up 
basically with this. And so the kind of traveling back is them getting to know each other, of course, to the various levels of intimacy. And then we have them getting home and just the kind of settling in of Jamie trying to find her place in this household. She's a healer and that helps her kind of establish herself. And this book in particular had the scenes that my mind is able or was able to conjure when I was thinking of a Julie Garwood book, whether it be that traveling back portion, or there is a scene where there is a warrior basically laid out, they assume he's going to die, they're ready to give up the last rites, and Jamie comes out and is like, hey, hey, what's going on and is able to heal him basically and just that whole scenario as well as there is this outside instigator and not just an outside instigator an outside antagonist now the revelation of this antagonist because i did not remember who it was didn't love the twist of that however this kind of garwood idea of having this outside villain in this case the villain is given a voice from the first chapter because one of the first things we learn about alec in the prologue is that his previous wife has died and they think that she took her own life rumors start that he maybe had a hand in her death and so there is a lot going on there but as readers we get this outside perspective and know that there is a villain loose and so then when things start happening to Jamie at the keep some of these being also little bits that I was able to pick out of my memory that we know that there is something else going on there and we have this expectation of this outside force. However, for this having been planted so early, so much of the book really revolves around what Jamie perceives as these wars she started, but how it's really her getting these people on her side. I really liked on the exploration of Julie Garwood's books on Faded Mates, which you should absolutely listen to, that they talk about Garwood's books being about this kind of finding of community. And I really think that that is at the heart here based on the two books that I read, again, The Bride and The Secret. Because in The Bride in particular, we have this expectation that Jamie has this expectation that she is starting all this conflict and that she is a burden and she has to make herself useful and worthwhile to Alec to be able to earn her place. But in reality, she is earning the loyalty of all of these men and these different clans through these actions that she thinks are off-putting. However, it's also a real celebration in some ways of strong women because Garwood's heroines are plucky and spirited. They go head to head with their romantic interests. And if these are kind of like your more alpha, I hate that word, but your more domineering kind of type, they have to be able to fight back. And that's where the sparks fly. That is where there is that banter and that interest. And so we are seeing them go toe to toe and the respect that comes from that and the love that grows from that. And we are also able to see that dual point of view. Now on Faded Mates, they have a much more widespread knowledge of romance history in particular. And so they talked about Garwood really being ahead of the game in doing this in some ways. But again, we get to see the dual point of view of both of our romantic leads, but being able to see into our hero's mind in many ways and that vulnerability, the way that these heroines are laying them bare in many ways, that emotion that they're unable to articulate at first and that they have to kind of grapple with and accept and being able to see it from their point of view. As a reader, it's really interesting to watch how this has changed because here we can move in between both of our couple within the same chapter. And the chapters are much longer, I would say, than I would expect from a historical romance today, probably because if I'm expecting from something like Avon, now granted this is not Avon, and I think that does play into the differences in pacing as well, because while all authors have unique voices and styles, I do think on some level, especially in the historical realm, I personally have really kind of honed in on Avon because that is where I found the best historicals for a long time, and so I've gotten used to that distinctive kind of editing style, and part of that is switching back and forth between the hero and the heroine in a straight romance in point of view or between either the hero and the hero or the heroine and the heroine in a gay romance. And that's also been one of my biggest stumbling blocks in some romances is only being able to see one point of view. And so here we do have both of those point of views and that being a more novel thing and then that being a more flushed out romantic interest. So it changes the dynamic of the couple and how the romance is reading and what purpose it's serving. Now I can't speak to that completely because I don't think I've read a whole lot of romance 
romances pre like Garwood and Quinn and McNaught and Joanna Lindsay and all of these and I know even like Joanna Lindsay and Judith McNaught and a lot of those authors really changed a lot even within their own careers but I haven't read enough to be able to speak on that because Garwood like I said really laid the foundation for me personally. So I think the combination of both having these really spunky, spirited, self-sufficient heroines and these heroes that we could see their more vulnerable side. We could see when they were being a little bit colder what was lying underneath. It helped kind of ease some of that and some of that more domineering behavior that, you know, as a woman, I wouldn't be for in my own relationships. But I kind of enjoy that tension in reading and both of these characters kind of having to come to terms with what's expected of them socially, what they want out of their relationship, how they communicate with each other, and being able to navigate all of that and seeing the way these heroines change often soften their heroes, but more importantly, seeing the way they change the communities they're in. And so it's not just about them being accepted by the community, which is absolutely part of it, but them being such an integral functioning part of that community and making space for themselves, but also making that community better, which is really illustrated in The Secret, which is what I'm reading for book club. And I kind of went back and forth because we were trying to find a Garwood to read for book club. And it had been so long since I'd read any of them. I didn't really know where to start. And the Faded Mates episode on The Bride hadn't come out yet because we try and pick romance books a couple of months out at this point. And so based on my ratings on Goodreads, I picked The Secret because I had had rated it higher. So when I was rereading The Bride, I was like, what's going on here? Because everything I can remember about a Garwood, I remember from The Bride. So how is the secret rated higher? Especially because when we circle back to, like I said, those buttons that are installed, I clearly, you know, I really gravitate toward a marriage of convenience, which is really at the heart of that. I really gravitate toward banter, which is really at the heart of that. I really do like an external villain at some points, like in my Lisa Kleypas. But all of that is there, even if the structure of it is a lot different. Because like I said, we spend so much time traveling and then we get back to home and things just keep happening, but it's unclear what we're really building to, even as we know we have this outside villain kind of dangling. And then once that is revealed, and kind of resolved. It's not really resolved, which is almost kind of good because the revelation there, like I said, wasn't great. And so we just kind of leave that. And then we move into another thing because of course, Jamie had someone she was promised to back home that her father had basically sold her off to. And then he comes in. And so we have lots of things kind of thrown in and it doesn't have the same kind of normal structure that we would expect today where we're building to that real climax or conflict. We are building to a climax or conflict here, but in a much different way. And it's really about seeing these characters interact with these circumstances and how their relationship and how they as people develop within all of these kind of outside things coming in. And so in The Secret, we have Judith and Ian and Judith is best friends with Frances Catherine. And The Secret is also great at exploring that female friendship. And Judith is English, Frances Catherine is Scottish. They met at one of like the border fairs back when they were children. And another thing I really love about Garwood, or at least in these two books, we've talked about the idea of community and there isn't always necessarily a robust community of women for our heroines. In The Secret, yes. In The Bride, no. Also with that, the emphasis on the plaid and the being claimed and the ownership of that, but also this idea of it being representative, of being welcomed into the community in other ways. So there's like the sexier explanation and then the more communal explanation as well. But at least in both of these two books, there is usually some conflict with another woman in this community that usually kind of revolves around our heroine coming in and taking a place from her. Place, power, or her upsetting the dynamic in some way. And our heroine then has to navigate that. And she usually is able to really accurately see that other woman. And even if the woman is not treating her well, she is often able to give extreme empathy to it. And not in a way where she's kind of a pushover. Not that empathy is ever the trait of a pushover. She's able to be kind of spunky in her confrontation at times. But there is that moment of confrontation. And often she is able to see this woman clearly, see this woman's struggles clearly, and kind of meet her on common ground, and they are able to move forward together, which is a really beautiful sentiment. And then if that is not possible, we as readers get a moment of kind of like mean girl comeuppance out of it. And so I really enjoy 
both of the ways that those are navigated and how often that antagonism is really grounded and rooted. And so in The Secret, we have both the community of women being a lot stronger and Judith really strengthening the connections between women in this community but we also then have that kind of really satisfying moment of comeuppance. So how was Judith brought to this community? She had promised Frances Catherine, her best friend, that she would be present for her birth because both Frances Catherine's mother and grandmother died in childbirth and she is really afraid of that. So Frances has basically gone in front of the clan. Her brother is brothers with the Laird. That always feels so weird to say, but it's what's going on here. And basically gotten permission for Judith to come to them even though she is English. And so Ian is part of a party that goes back to get Judith. And Judith has had a very interesting upbringing in that her mother fled her father. She didn't know that for a long time. She thought her father was dead. She has grown up half the year with her aunt and uncle who she really loves and really love her, treat her well, and the other half of the year with her mother and another uncle who does not treat her as well and often gets drunk and violent. So Ian takes Judith back. They have some attraction, some flirtation on the way back. We always have some really nice travel sequences. We will move through the countryside and then she gets back to this community and really becomes valuable as a midwife despite the fact that she has never had a child herself let alone engage in the activities that would result in a child. Now there is something to be said for the fact that at least in the books I've read and to my recollection a lot of the heroines in Julie Garwood's books are virgins. Now when I was reading them that didn't bother me at all. Honestly, I don't know that it bothers me still. But when I was first reading these books, and you know, I'm not going to get too personal here on anything, but that felt like an accurate reflection based on my own personal experience. And so it was letting me explore things in a way. I think that there are real valid criticisms of the kind of purity culture aspect of it in these books, in kind of an emphasis on that today, which I think we've gotten away from in a lot of ways. But there are larger conversations to have there. But these are largely inexperienced heroines. And so again, it gets a little bit at this being the kind of historical version of Faded Mates in some ways. There's that kind of idea of claiming and whatnot. So Judith is making her name in this community. However, the fact that she is a midwife who has never birthed a baby until in the pages of this book is not the secret at the heart of this, but rather who her father is. And she has never met her father, but because there's all of the like intricate politics and like inner wars between the clans, which to be fair, it's kind of hard to keep track of the politics sometimes. We know it, but we don't necessarily feel it. It's just kind of the outside instigator to a lot of things. And so it kind of comes to a head in the third act of the book, but doesn't really feel active prior to that. So spoiler alert, Ian and Judith end up getting married and she thinks that her lineage is still a secret. The secret, if you will. However, it's not. She has this ring. He's seen it. He's able to place it. We know based on his point of view that he knows, but she doesn't know that because she doesn't have his point of view. So how would she? So that kind of is what kind of comes to a culmination at the end. So I was looking back and I was like, why did I clearly love this book so much more? And there was a part of me that expected them to flip. One, because as I was reading The Bride, it was clearly the one that I associate in my mind with Garwood so much more clearly, but also because when I was rereading the Bridgerton series, I really did flip in what books were my favorites as a teen versus what books were my favorites as an adult. And I kind of expected that to be the same here, especially because these were some of the first romances that I ever read. And I was much younger than I am now. Not that I didn't have taste when I was much younger, but that my tastes have surely altered in that time. But in this case, I don't think so. I think I still preferred The Secret, even though it didn't have that marriage of convenience. But I think I really liked watching Ian and Judith really spar in their attraction. And so instead we had these moments where the attraction just built to a point where they couldn't help it and they were just smushing faces. And then we also had this dangle of the secret that was looming large, even if the payoff of it didn't feel as large as maybe it could have. The payoff of it I thought actually read really well. I really enjoyed that. There is miscommunication, but in a way that is really kind of lovely and also a little comedic at times and the community aspect of it and the way that Judith was able to see the community build community, build a community of women was really lovely. And I especially loved the friendship between her and Frances Catherine. And so I think that even though the bride looms larger in my memory, I still do 
prefer The Secret. But I also think that these are really strong Garwood entries. I will be very interested to see if I'm able to circle back to some of these other books, whether they go on sale on Kobo, whether I'm able to get my hands on some used editions of them, how I respond to some of these other historical titles. And it's also interesting because I do really correlate Garwood with the Scottish romances, but not all of her historicals are. And at the end of her career, what she has been publishing recently are not historicals and honestly not really what I gravitate to. So it's very interesting to think about what really looms in my consciousness as a reader, how a specific moment, the fact that these were my introduction to romance can really shape my reading journey and how I respond to things as a romance reader today are shaped by where I started and how I came up as a romance reader. But I was also really pleasantly surprised to realize that these held up much better than I feared they would. And there was still this humor and heart there. And even if I was engaging with the text a little more actively, potentially a little more critically, I was really still able to enjoy it and its heroines. Even if they both had violet eyes, I do think that I probably got some incorrect ideas about violet eyes. It was also interesting to think about the fact that these were some steamy scenes. One, when I first read them, and probably when they came out as well, but now they almost feel, they're not, you know, prudish by any means, but it almost feels like they have a filter over them. They're not quite the same as today. They didn't necessarily strike me as having a lot of really coded language that we might laugh at today. It's also possible I'm a little bit more immune to that as well, though, but it is interesting to think about how some of that has shifted. I think, like I said, the biggest shift I noticed in this was just the pacing and how it felt different than I expected. And it wasn't necessarily driven by a forward momentum of like a big plot, but was a lot more internal and about this finding of love and community, which I mean, all romances are about finding love in some way and are a little bit more internal and domestic than other plots potentially. But I think that there was something different here than we might even get today. So I don't know, that's a really sprawling vague overview, but I would be really interested to hear your thoughts as a romance reader. If you've read Garwood, if you haven't read Garwood, how you view her impact on historical romance. I definitely think we're seeing it today. I don't think we'd have Julia Quinn without a Julie Garwood. And I think so much of what I respond to as a romance reader to this day is really rooted in that banter and that humor and that connection that we really see established here. So you know the drill. Let me know what you're thinking. Like, subscribe if you feel like it. Regardless, thank you as always for hanging out and listening to my thoughts. I feel like I had so many here that I was barely able to graze and I'm sure I will think of so many more the moment I turn this camera off. So let's keep the conversation going. But again, thanks for hanging out. Read something good and yeah. Bye.